welcome back to the channel today we're going to talk about four new books that i read part of my reading vlog series for the winter season and of course give you my first impressions on them because most of them happen to be volume ones so i don't know how the story ends for them but regardless let's get started the first book that we're going to talk about here is A Cat from Our World and the Forgotten Witch. This is by Hiro Kashiwamba. This is volume one published by the folks at Seven Seas Entertainment. And in a nutshell, this tells the story of this adorable giant cat who gets isekai into another world. However, when he is struck by a truck in the streets, this particular witch from another world happens to summon for a familiar and I guess the two link up and the cat ends up in her world where it's fantasy based with uh, heroes fighting against the demon lord and stuff like that. She used to be a mage, I guess, or a witch and helped the hero defeat the demon lord. Now she is much older and people have forgotten and they just say that she is the town witch and are uh, really scared of her, thinking the worst of her. But she's actually a very somewhat cranky but sweet sweet old lady at this point and she wants a companion so she does a summoning spell for a familiar beast and the cat happens to show up. Now they don't say anything in this volume to suggest it. I don't know if we see other cats in the series. I assume not and the size difference is explained. Apparently in this world people are tiny compared to our world. I think part of the appeal here for me aside from the art which I'll talk about in a moment is the fact that this is is a story about two kindred spirits regardless of it being a cat and a human not knowing that they need each other suffering from past trauma in the case of the witch she has been forgotten and at the same time she is misjudged and criticized by the population for something that honestly she's not at fault with people are going by appearances and believing old tales that she's this evil witch when in fact she ended up saving everybody when she she was younger. The part I really enjoyed the most, aside from the heartwarming story, is the art. I think it is fantastic. I love the expression on the cat's face how he reacts to the witch's actions because she thinks, oh great, I summoned a lazy beast who won't do anything and only wants to be fed and taken care of, but there's a miscommunication. He doesn't really understand her at first because he's used to our human customs. So the expressions and body language from the cat are really spot on to a real cat. Character designs are clean, nice to look at, and well-defined. I like this world. It's fun. The magical stuff, while brief, looks really good too. So I am excited to continue with Volume 2 to see more of uh, the action from the witch's perspective. There are some really cute scenes in this, and like I mentioned, these two characters have had interesting traumas in their lives, but the fact that they can get together and form a friendship and a partnership is really cute and wholesome to see. So I am enjoying this series, and hopefully Volume 2 comes out soon, because I really want to keep the story going and see what happens with the two of them. Oh boy, uh, the next book that we're going to talk about is pretty interesting. This is Came the Mirror and Other Tales. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the stuff inside because Takahashi's uh, representatives and peeps on uh, the other side of the pond, they do not like you showing stuff from uh, Takahashi's books and they will strike channels down and stuff if uh, they happen to notice it. So I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to show you uh, some of the colored pages here at the beginning and a couple of still images. So this is a short story collection, which happens to be one of my favorite things in manga. I love short stories. For this book, we have six tales. Came the Mirror tells the story of these kids that now have a mirror, sort of like a curse, in the palm of their hands. They could die if they don't do a specific mission, which is uh, seeing the evil souls that are trapped within uh, individuals that are doing bad deeds and sort of exercising them and taking care of them. That becomes their responsibility, and if they don't do it, it could get them killed, but if they accomplish the goal, they're safe or something like that. It's fun. 
nice mix of horror and action. I thought that was pretty cool. The ending I thought was just a bit underwhelming, just a tad. The next story, Revenge Doll, tells the story of a very self-centered, horrible mangaka and the things he says and does because things don't go his way. His series is being canceled, so he takes it out on his staff and he gets a surprise package of a, a revenge doll that supposedly if you write the names of three people, uh, they'll get cursed and the final, the third and final strike will be uh, to actually murder somebody. So he's contemplating on using it on various people. It's a very odd story. You're not supposed to root for any of these guys. So the result of it was just kind of weird, but it was interesting to see a short story set in the manga creation world. That was fun. The Star Has a Thousand Faces tells the story of this popular young actress. She commits murder, supposedly, and is paranoid that her career is going to end, even though it was an accident and she's doing everything imaginable to escape and retire. She even thinks of ending her life and stuff like that. And the result was okay. <laughs> so far, these stories have interesting setups and just okay resolutions. Lovely Flower reminded me of a quirky Junji Ito gross out comic and it tells the story of this young lady who is married to a scientist if I remember correctly and she is getting stalked by this individual with a very peculiar flower that is very stinky to her but works sort of like an aphrodisiac for everybody else and people start getting obsessed with the flower so they want more of it and she thinks that this person is a stalker and again, kind of reminded me of an Ito story, to be honest. I thought it was uh, one of the better ones here. With Cat, I think this is my favorite out of the six stories here. It tells the story of these two kids that at first hate each other because of an incident when they were young. The young kid was climbing a tree and he was frightened of cats. The young girl climbs up to show him the cat and he falls from the tree branch and breaks his arm. Now the kid hates the young girl and a long time passes. I believe now they're in middle school or high school, one of the two. I don't know. And they still don't talk to each other. Unfortunately, the young girl, uh, without knowing, with her old cat, places a curse on the young man and his arm is now cat-like. And a lot of weird stuff happens. But this one, I thought, had a nice ending to it. A really quirky, funny premise that I think pays off at the end and sticks the landing. I really did enjoy this one. It, it reminded me the most of what I like about Rumiko Takahashi. And last but not least, My Sweet Sunday. I believe this was released for one of the anniversaries for uh, the Shonen Sunday. Day magazine, and it tells the story here of the two mangaka, Rumiko Takahashi and Mitsuru Adachi. It's them in chibi manga form telling their quirky stories on how they got into the business and how they admire the work that uh, the other writer does, as well as talking about the manga industry and all that. I thought that was really fascinating, kind of quirky for a short story because it's actually pretty long compared to the others because it has a lot of dialogue, but it is worth reading. If you're a fan of the creators, if you're a fan of the manga industry, I think this will be to your liking. So yeah, overall solid uh, list of short stories. They don't necessarily stick the landing for me, but they're fun nonetheless. The art is beautiful on all of them. That is for sure one of the big positives for this book. And again, if you like Rumiko Takahashi, I think this is a book that you need to add for your collection. Next one on the list is Orb on the Movements of the Earth. This is written by Uoto. This won a bunch of awards, if I remember correctly, and it is a two-in-one omnibus edition trade paperback published by Seven Seas Entertainment. Now, this one is pretty interesting. I took a while to figure out how I would go about this because the subject matter for Orb is complicated. I will tell you in a brief summary of this, but you could easily do a full analysis, a full video essay on the themes here of uh, Orb and still not scratch the surface. I think this is a fantastic series. This story takes place in 15th century Europe and we follow a young kid called Rafael 
who is studying to go into university. He wants to be an astronomer, but at this time, you might remember that with the church being in complete control of certain areas, that was looked down upon because that would invite uh, heretical teachings and all that stuff that go against the doctrine at the time. So Rafal is hiding the fact that he wants to be an astronomer and is telling his stepfather that he wants to study uh, theology. So he meets with this former heretic and this guy teaches him in a nutshell about heliocentrism and the idea, of course, that the earth revolves around the sun. It's not the center of the universe and all that stuff. And these are things that happen in real life. Unfortunately, due to the ignorance and fear, a lot of people lost their lives because of this. And this story reminds us of that. Humans are capable of horrible things and also without spoiling things at a certain point in the first couple of chapters the story moves forward a decade and we follow other characters that find Rafal's teachings that he left behind and continue the story from there and their own journey of self-discovery and challenging what was the norm back then. Now it is very important for me to point out that a lot of people will discredit the book or will just claim it as anti-establishment uh, or anti-religion and all that stuff. And I don't really see it that way. It tells more of a cautionary tale of what happens when we let fear dictate our lives and oppress people without the fundamentals of a good spirit and reaching out and conversing with individuals. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this is a story rooted in fear of the unknown and scientific stuff was not well known back then and it took a giant leap of faith of certain people that wanted to progress the knowledge and science and all that stuff for our better understanding of nature, of space, of earth, of the human experience if you will, that progress which I think should never be stopped and should keep pushing forward is the central drive of this book and the part that appeals to me the most. Also the fact that it's in medieval Europe, which is fascinating to me. I love studying about that time period and the characters here are very human in the way that they are written. They have fears and concerns, but also hope and optimism of the fact that the knowledge that they are seeking can change the world for good. And it's very important to remind ourselves that it's not about the religion, it's about people fearing and committing things in the name of a doctrine, when the doctrine does not call for uh, torture and violence and all that stuff. It's very important to remember that we are heavily flawed beings, but it should not be the total absolute of a thing, if that makes sense. I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, some people might not like what I'm saying, but I wanted to share my thoughts on the book. The art is great at times, but other times it's just okay. It fluctuates between amazing and kind of mid. But overall, I like the fact that it blends real topics with these characters and real human dilemmas presented here. Yeah, pretty interesting book, Orb on the Movements of the Earth. The last book we're going to talk about is one of my most anticipated books. I'm so happy that I finally have it here in my hands. It is Steel of the Celestial Shadows, Volume 1. This is by Daruma Matsura, and it tells the story of a down-and-out samurai named Ryudo Konosuke. He is struggling to be part of 19th century Japan because ever since he was a kid, he's been afflicted by this curse that leaves him unable to touch metal, which sounds pretty wacky, but considering that he is a samurai, he's not able to wield 
that extension of himself. And to not be able to do that leaves him depressed, angry, frustrated. And whenever he tries to go into town to get a new job, he can't because everybody's mocking him. He can't accept any bodyguard jobs. And he always has a disheveled look. People tell him to shave, but he can't because he can't touch the razor blade. So that leads to some humiliating moments for our main protagonist. Now, in a moment of despair, facing off against some bullies later down the story, he is down on his luck and wishes for them to end his life in combat, which leads to, I guess, one of the most iconic scenes in this first volume when you see the sword bend backwards and it pokes the bad guy in his forehead. This leads to our main protagonist being involved with a young, beautiful lady who is mysteriously enamored by our samurai and wants to marry him. She is his biggest supporter and wants him to do well and is taking care of him. He can't fathom the idea that luck might be on his side and things might get better, so there's a lot of self-doubt going on here. I don't want to reveal a whole lot, but I do like that throughout the story, even though it touches on the curse aspect early on, you might think it's a straightforward samurai story. But as you keep reading into the chapters and the encounters that these characters have, you realize that there's a lot of supernatural aspects to this. And there's sort of a layer of another world just itching to come at you and appear and make itself known to you. One of the strongest aspects of this manga definitely has to be the art. This looks phenomenal. I love the contrast of the well-detailed backgrounds with the almost cell shady character designs. It looks really good. I was blown away by the craftsmanship here by the uh, creator. Look how pretty everything looks and how almost borderline comical because of our main protagonist and his facial expressions. Yet there's an elegance and a regalness when the young lady appears, Sukidono. My favorite aspect, aside from the supernatural stuff, is the fact that Ryudo reminds me of the everyman. He is conflicted, he is confused, but he's willing to work at it no matter how long it takes, even when things are at their worst. And sometimes it takes an external force, in this case, his newly appointed wife, to remind him that life is worth living and you need that extra boost, that support system to help you get through things and make you a better individual. I think that's a great message, if you ask me. So there it is, guys. Another successful reading vlog in the can, if you will. Thank you so very much for all the likes, all the comments, all the new people that have subscribed. Welcome. That is going to be it for now. Thank you so much once again. God bless. Stay safe out there. And I will catch all of you on our next video.